Right, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to the annual VIP Q&A evening. Thanks for coming. I know some of you have travelled a long way to make this evening's event. Um, I'm going to sort of do a quick intro along the table. A lot of the people are, I suspect you already know, but um, there may be a few you don't. So, um, Steve Avery, Academy Manager. Tony what, 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 our new <laughs> striker. <laughs> Skipper, Johnny J. <laughs> CEO, Katrine. <laughs> Richard Murray, not quite here yet. <laughs> Chrissy Parks, Football Secretary. Tony Keohane, Operations <laughs> Manager, Training Grant and the Valley, and something else. <laughs> and David Joyce, Chief Financial Officer. <laughs> okay, so we're going to um, kick off with, um, Craig kindly supplied us with a few uh, questions uh, that had been emailed in. So we're going to kick off with um, some of those first. So, uh, the first question. Uh, Charlton already has one of the smallest staffing budgets in the championship and is losing, I understand, five million a year. This loss is likely to increase as fans' disenchantment with the current running of the club will inevitably lead to a reduction in season ticket holders next season and beyond. Could Katrine please try to explain how without FFP in the, in the form set out at the time of the takeover. Roland envisages the club to break even in the championship or indeed League One, which appears to be where we are heading at the moment. I hope not. Um, but um, so everybody knows the principle that we try to run our club uh, via break even model. I mean, there's, it's, it's underpinned by a simple principle. First of all, is controlling the cost and try not to increase cost, but obviously because we're in a competitive league, we have to try to do that not at the expense of, of our competitiveness. Um, but the other side of it is basically increasing our revenue. And um, I mean, after last week's great deal at the Premier League, uh, we already blessed with a million more on the revenue side uh, soon. And I personally believe that we, we can grow our revenue quite substantial still. And it's also part of our business plan for the next coming years is to com uh, grow our commercial revenue. Um, one example that, that I can give as well is uh, after next season, for example, the club shop uh, will be back in our own hands, which will be another revenue stream that will be, be part of ours. And we will look for those kind of streams to come in and and it, it will be tough, it will be a challenge, but um, I personally believe in it, and, and obviously we need your support to do that as well. Thank you. Um, next question. Uh, I would like to express my concerns that a seeming lack of direction off-field is causing the current problems the team are experiencing. In my time watching football, it's the teams where the off-pitch situation is clouded that teams are relegated more often than not. We are showing these signs. I want to be wrong. Any comments? Um, uh, I've been here now, I think, a year and I'm in only one month, although it feels like maybe three, four years. <laughs> um, it has been very eventful. I'm not, not going to deny that. I think when we took over the club, uh, we were bottom. We fought relegation until the almost the last game and uh, and on top of that most of our players were end of contract um, at the end of the season so a lot of things has hap have happened uh, we um, in the summer had to get a new team together a new manager as you all are aware and 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 lots of things have have changed but uh, and that's why i think for me a key priority and I mean, i'm sure you all agree is is to create stability now and the stability comes from obviously signing players on long-term deals and, and, and getting them on, on, on longer contracts so we don't have to constantly worry about 
players coming in and out, and 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 the next big part, and that's probably where we we lacked recently, is, is try to keep our manager a bit longer than a few months. <laughs> and uh, I mean, obviously, uh, when Jose came in, uh, he was here to do a job uh, to keep us in championship. He did that perfectly. We we signed Bob with the idea to keep him long term. Um, but it didn't work out, and, and now the appointment of Guy is, is, is for sure long term. I want it to be long term. It's important to create this stability with the manager, but also with the backroom staff. Uh, football is already a business where things change overnight, and there's so many invariables that you cannot control. And um, I mean, it's a people's business, so all the people here sitting along me, I mean, I heavily rely upon, and I could not do this job, or nobody could do this job. And, in the football club if it weren't for them. So apart from the manager and also from those people, it's really important that, that we keep them happy and that people come, like the fans, come back to Charlton and enjoy themselves and, and, and it, it becomes a club that you can be proud of. Yeah, sorry. Um, it was remiss of me earlier on to mention that uh, the manager did send his apologies for tonight. Um, he's gone to uh, scout the Reading Wigan game ahead of uh, Friday night's game at Wigan. So. Um, the two, the two players um, were kind enough to step in at the last moment in place of Guy. <laughs> two for the price of one. Uh, next question then. Um, football is increasingly a global sport seeking out talent across the world and indeed our own club is now Belgian owned and directed. Why is it that since the change of ownership all three appointed team managers have been Belgium or come from Belgium? Uh, because Belgium is the center of the world now. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I cannot deny, obviously, the links um, with, with Belgium. Um, it's besides Bob Peters, I think the appointments that we have made, uh, we made because uh, Josie and Guy had uh, good work experience or experience on the previous experience under the ownership. And I think um, with hiring such an important role, such high level, in every business basically, if you hire somebody at that level, you heavily rely upon recommendations of people that you trust or, or recommendations of, or with people that you previously worked. Um, but I, I understand probably you, all your concern and I, I can, well, say to you that it's not a policy to only recruit Belgian managers or players or so. I mean, obviously that would be very stupid uh, on our behalf. Does the owner have any idea of the sheer extent of the alienation and dismay that his model, and more to the point, his implementation of his model is causing amongst Charlton supporters? and which will be reflected in season ticket sales, whatever division we're in next season. And if he is aware, does he actually care? Uh, of course he cares. I mean, I care, he care. I think we all care. Um, I think uh, whoever, everybody in this room here, whatever unites us here is, is the love and the passion that we have for this club. And, and that passion and love should be our starting point to make this, to work together and, and to find ways where we can communicate and, and work very good together to bring this club back where it belongs. Sorry, you're getting all the questions at the moment. Mr. Murray's still not arrived. Yeah, I don't think it's a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> um, at last year's Q&A, Katrine said that uh, Roland doesn't do failure in relation to the relegation clause in the purchase price. Could she explain what Roland would consider success in both the short and long term for Charlton Athletic? Yes, um, I already explained this probably a, a few times, but I, I will do it again for people that haven't, uh, didn't know. I think uh, our aim always has been, uh, when we came here, to create a stable and competitive championship club. Um, which we will try to do, and with that we mean obviously on the playing side, uh, we want to be competitive. Um, apart from that, it's really a vision of the owner that a football club, like he tries to do also in his other football clubs, it becomes a gathering point um, where you meet your fans and uh, your, sorry, your, f your friends and your family, and 
you just come to the football because you want to see your friends and your family and you have a good time. You enjoy the football, you have a beer, you have a laugh, and you go home with a good, with a good feeling. And um, we will try to do that, obviously, with providing you a good competitive team. But we also try to do that um, by, by upgrading the facility, the beautiful stadium that we have. Um, I, I was in Belgium yesterday um, uh, to meet with, with the owner. And um, I had to convince him, or well, not convince him, I had to present him the investments that we, that we want to do in the summer. And he gave the sign off uh, for close to a million pounds to invest into the stadium in the summer. And I think it's a strong message that he has for the club. And we should recognize that it goes from a new big screen to renovating the West End, the lounges. Uh, we have ventilation and air conditioning that needs to be replaced. All small things, you would say, but those are all very necessary to, to make this a nicer environment. And, and if the facility needs those kind of investment, then we recognize that. And we cannot do everything at once. We will do it step by step. I mean, last close season, you all know, we, we invested, uh, invested in the pitch. We have now Wi-Fi. I think we're the only London stadium where Wi-Fi is really working, not like in Wembley. Uh, so, um, and that's 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 the that's the vision and the future for this club. I mean, I, I, can I just say? I mean, uh, I think it's it's probably my personal ambition and. The, ambition of every, I, it would be much more popular for me to say I want a club in Premier League. It's, uh, I mean, uh, the, obviously that's the division of every club in championship. Um, that championship? Of course. That championship? No, it, it's, it, I, I, I want to portray to you a very realistic image and uh, we come a long way. I mean, we were fighting relegation last year, we're, we're in the zone this year. We need to, Rome wasn't built in a day. And we need to be very realistic and, and, and we will try to build up a team that can be, can be very competitive. And the ultimate goal of every club, every player, is to play in Premier League. But I'm not going to say to you, yes, it will happen in two years. I, I cannot promise you. It's, it stays football. How many clubs now who invested heavily in their teams like Nottingham Forest can, can say bye-bye to their dreams of Premier League? Just to be, we did invest in the team. I don't understand. Yeah, can, can we hold all the questions from the floor, please, till after we've done these submitted questions? Because no, there I is. Can, I can answer this one. Just the. What was the question? It's the why we don't, if we have, if you, the owner has all this money, why don't he invest in the team? I think um, uh, he does invest in the team. Uh, I don't think Igor Vitokele came for peanuts. And uh, Mr. Watt was also recently acquired, um, also not for peanuts. Uh, and we <laughs> 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 and currently and currently he's showing us the money. <laughs> but um, no, just to be, we 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 try to really uh, try to build a competitive squad with the budget that we have. Uh, and I think we 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 did already quite okay in the summer and every transfer window we will try to improve the squad. But also if you think about, I think over 70% of the transfers, um, I think in the world are on a free. And we acquired also some good players in the summer on a free. I think Henderson we got from West Ham. I mean, you're going, not going to say to me, good Monson was also on a free. We invest in those players as well. So, um, I mean, not every player that we, that we tried to get is, and that's part of player recruitment will be a success. I mean, it's it's just not, uh, people make mistakes in football. Football is like that. Okay, moving back to the uh, submitted questions. With respect to Guy Luzon, can you explain why Jose Riga, who was available and had a proven track record and understanding of Charlton, was not deemed the best candidate for the vacant head coach position at the Valley was seen as suitable for standard liage a few months later? Well, I, I think, I mean, this is probably the most uh, 
uh, the topic where most of you want an answer for. Um, when we recruit a, a manager, obviously, uh, we get lots of applications uh, when the dismissal of Bob Peters was announced. We, we interviewed several candidates. Um, and once you have people's CVs and you have their experience on paper and then you start interviewing um, the people personally, uh, it became clear that Guy Luzon was, um, was going to be our favorite for this and this is how it happened. And uh, I, I'm very happy for Josie that he, he now is, um, has a job after Blackpool and um, we are in contact quite regularly still and he also wishes Charlton still the very best. Sorry, sorry, I'm going to step in. Can we wait till the open forum of all these questions, please? We'll just continue with these prearranged. Thank you. Uh, Katrine Wright, tomorrow night there is a public meeting of Charlton fans. Are you and Richard <laughs> aware of this? Um, and uh, are you concerned that many fans consider this necessary in order to find out more about how the club is being run? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm aware of it. Um, I think if fans want to know how the club is run, I think we, we changed something quite um, different this year is, is with the fans forum. Uh, we now try to include all the, the fans groups, um, which is very different from last year. So if, I fee if there is a frustration about the transparency about the fans forum, I'm, I'm open to suggestions, but I feel, still feel it's the best tool uh, to communicate with the fans. Um, this meeting was organized by the Supporters Trust, I think. And I'm really much a believer, I know they represent a really big group of fans, but I really am a believer of treating every fan equal. I don't want to favor certain fans over others. I already met with the Trust probably two to three times since I've been here. Um, and um, they sent me an email for a meeting and uh, and also to, to talk about club development. And I referred them to a colleague of mine who is responsible for club development and they declined. And on the basis of that, they organized this meeting. So it's their decision. But I really encourage fans, if they, they want to know more about how the club is run, we, we will look at the format of the fans forum and, and see what we can improve. Um, because I want to engage with all the supporters groups and not just the supporters group that represents a certain, a certain uh, amount of fans so that's okay uh, while there appear to be many advantages to being part of a network of clubs many of the players recruited from Liège who have then been moved to Charlton have pr pr proved to be unsuitable for both who is making these costly errors and what is being done to ensure that money is not wasted in the in this way in the future um, uh, I can say I understand some of the criticism, obviously, regarding last year. I think the, some of the players we brought in were not suitable or didn't prove to be a success. Uh, you can never know. I think this year is, is quite different, uh, I must say. I think we have quite some successes. Um, and just, I mean... Like I said before, I think player recruitment is probably the most difficult thing of this business. It's, 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 you will either, whether they're from the network or from outside the network, you can never be so sure unless it's Ronaldo or Messi that they will do great, you know, so. And, and, and we have to, we, I mean, obviously it's, a, it's costly errors if, if it pr proved to be wrong, but we try to minimize the risk as much as possible. We have a, a process in place for recruiting players, uh, which we try to follow even when transfer deadline is very, very near. Um, and uh, emotions are running high, especially from the manager. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think there will be a club um, everywhere, a football club in the world, who doesn't make mistakes with players. Uh, I accept that this is Mr. Du Chatelet's business, and as such, he makes the decisions but have any lessons been learned about the management and communication of the recent change in manager? If so, what would be done differently in the future? Yeah, um, I mean, this all relates of 
me being accused of a liar, so I'm going to tell this once and for all. So either you believe me or you don't. Uh, it's up to you. So, um, right, we're on a bad run and we have the Brighton game and we need to create some positivism because things are, the there is no confidence and, and so we try to create some, inject some positive into the manager, into the team and we lose the Brighton game. Uh, I go home and I think, oh, damn, what, what are we going to do about this and, and what's the problem of this? So um, on Sunday, um, I called the board meeting <coughs> and uh, we discussed over the phone together with uh, Richard and with our, with our owner, wh what, is the, what is the problem and what are we going to do? And after discussing and explaining everything that we knew, we, we, we decided that the best thing to do was to dismiss Bob. So uh, what, what that decision was Sunday afternoon, I think. Yeah, Sunday afternoon. First thing, I inform obviously Bob and his staff. And uh, one of my first things that I did is, um, is call Ian, our press officer, uh, because I wanted the Charlton fans to know first that the head coach was dismissed because with Chris Powell, there were so many rumors already before it was announced and I think you're entitled to know it first. Then, obviously, as soon as it got announced, um, Sunday evening, uh, madness starts because you get lots of phone calls, emails. I think everybody uh, got applications or HR department got applications. Chris got applications as soon as it was announced. And so then the interview process started. And that's what I communicated on Monday. On Monday, I said, look, okay, um, we, we, we thank Bob for what happened. And now we're, we're interviewing candidates, which, we, uh, which will be the new head coach um, for us. And that's what happened. And we started interviewing people on Monday. And then uh, on Tuesday, it, become, it became apparent that there was, the favorite was, was chosen. And I think either you believe it or you don't, but it's the, I just, every statement that I made was a statement of the facts, what was going on at that point. And I, I don't appreciate call being called a liar. I mean, I've said it before in the fans forum, it's something that the owner said to me. He, he, will, he said to me, Catherine, I pay you to tell the truth. So he expects me always to, to be open and honest with him. And I try to do that the same with you. And all the ass these assumptions of being called a liar, it really not hurt me, but I was disappointed because I was never given the right to really really explain what happened. And all I did is try to communicate and, and keep you guys informed about what was going on on the, on the pitch. And the fact, uh, I mean, there was already a remark there um, that the new manager was appointed within 24 hours of, of the dismissal. I mean, it's normal in football. Norwich did it. Uh, Nottingham Forest uh, appointed their new head coach an hour or two after the dismissal. It's the way football goes. It's a very a business where you need to make decisions up, up, up like that. I need uh, on a on a daily basis. I need to make decisions about a variation of things, about a hundred different kind of things, and that's that's the way it goes. And obviously, the manager's uh, change is a very important one. But we carefully considered all the applications and we interviewed, and this is the decision that we made. Thank you. Right um, now, we've got Mr. Watt here. Look, there's a good question. Why, in view of our scoring problems, has Reza not been recalled from loan? <laughs> it's actually here. No, I think um, um, the, what happened to Teresa is that when he came back from the, from the World Cup, um, he, he came to us and he said that he had a, a very financially interesting proposition elsewhere. Um, and we, we decided to let him go on loan and, and pursue this. So um, we, we kind of tried to, to do what the player wanted, basically. And instead, we got Tony Watt Watt. Yeah, and I think the last one from this list then, how can we hope to progress when we, when we discard two of our best players, Kermigant and Morrison? Uh, um, regarding um, Jan, um, I already explained this before, but I will, I'll do it one more time. And this time it's on camera, so after that I will stop explaining it. Um, 
when we when we first came in in January last year, there were two players on on the list that were up for renewal immediately, Royce Wiggins and and Jan, and we met with both and we both uh, made a proposal to them. Uh, Royce took it and 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 Jan with Jan we couldn't reach an agreement about his um, about his contract, uh, so he went elsewhere. And uh, the situation with Michael is that I mean. He's the only player we re-signed on, on, from all the players who were end of contract this summer. Um, we signed him, or at least I signed him, with the belief that he would be a regular in the in the starting eleven. And being the ambitious guy that he is, he didn't just didn't settle with being on the bench. I mean, and I cannot force uh, Bob to play Michael Morrison. And um, after a couple of months, it became clear that he was not the first choice. And I sat down with him and I promised that we would find a solution because he wanted to play. So what do you want me to do? Do you deny a player to go if he wants to play? I don't think so. So. OK, thank you. Um, right, that concludes the first section of the um, questions. Um, do you want a literally a five-minute comfort break and get a drink? And then we'll go to an open floor. Please, yes, thank you. Okay, this is the uh, section where we'll start taking uh, questions from the floor. Um, to give Katrina a slightly longer break, um, we, uh, I'd like to get some of the uh, other guests on the top table involved. So, um, any questions at the moment, um, Steve, from the academy side of things? Anyone? Yeah, yeah, far away. Steve, um, just wondering who you think might break through. Question asked every year. Um, but who do you think are the next names who might see in the first team? Well, that puts a bit of pressure on young players, doesn't it, really? You've got to be careful there, I think. But uh, what, what I feel I can say is that we've got some good young players uh, still coming through uh, at under-21 within the development squad. And also within the current under-18 squad as well. They're the ones who are nearest, obviously, in terms of their age. But I think it's, it's, it's unfair to actually mention any individual. I mean, there's, what I will say is that people like Joe Gomez have come through this season and done very well, I, I feel. Um, and Carlin Grant, of course, Carlin Hearn Grant has come through. But I think what you've got to be prepared to accept with young players is that whilst um, th they make that what appears to be a meteoric rise, you know, th there then can come a steady enough period as well. And you just have to be patient w with the development. Um, but what, what I do think and what I can guarantee is that we've got some very good young players coming through uh, in the under-18 and under-21 under development group. That's for sure. Any, any more questions for Steve? I'm not sure if you're the right person to ask this, but do you know how we're progressing in getting category, is it category one or category A? Academy status? Category one, yeah. We're currently a category two academy. And uh, what I can say, and I think this backs some of what Katrine's been saying about this owner and w what he's prepared to um, do for this football club. And certainly uh, since he came in, uh, the message that I've been given and that I believe is a genuine message is that um, the current ownership is prepared to invest in the development of young players. And I think the current EPPP, which many people may have heard about, is that that, that, that demands that any football club, uh, if you're going to succeed, to become even a Category 2 where we are now, and we are succeeding, but if you're going to succeed further and go to Category 1, which is where I believe we've got to go, then there needs to be considerable investment. And I do, do believe the current ownership is behind that in terms of taking our young players forward. It, it will certainly help in terms of our recruitment of players. And uh, what I believe in, uh, and many coaches believe, is the best have got to play with the best. And so for that reason, we need to have the ambition of be becoming a Category 1 club. And I think that's where the ownership wants to take us. Yeah. That is a very positive message. And it's the first that I personally have heard about it. I would have thought the PR of the club should have been sufficiently up front to make that known to the fans and made publicly. And I think that 
is where communications are breaking down and have broken down. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, at this moment, we're um, uh, developing um, the plans. Um, previously, the club um, had submitted um, a planning application, um, which was accepted last year for a, a new training uh, ground facility. So um, we pulled the team um, together, um, and we've been looking at many different training grounds um, across the country, um, and taking the best of different pieces to bring together to uh, a, a new a new training ground facility. Um, at this very moment, um, we met we met with planning um, yesterday, um, and in the next six weeks, we'll um, we'll submit a revised planning um, for the new training ground facility. Um, and um, which, from from everything we've worked on and, and looked at, is a fantastic facility, and um, it'll support um, the, the the first team and the academy going forward, and and Charlton Football Club. Uh, at the moment, we're looking at um, the several different um, funding um, opportunities. Our relationship with the um, University of Greenwich, um, working with our community trust, um, and then there's um, FA Foundation um, in, in, um, <coughs> uh, investment. Um, and at the moment, we're considering which and how we, how we approach that. No, that, that funding's still there, and we're, con we're, we're looking at the different um, options around that funding. Uh, some conditions attached to that funding, we're considering those. This might be the same question. Can we obtain category... Uh, sorry, one? sorry, sorry, excuse me, one moment. Um, in reference to the PR side, some of it is really around um, the application um, with um, through the council. Um, the... Um, conscious both of the Charlton fans but also the local residents at the uh, training ground. So there's, there's a real balance to achieve um, and to not to offend either. Um, so in, in the coming weeks you, you, you will definitely hear more. I mean we, we really want to um, kind of share that with you. Um, but it, there is a, a fine balance and we have to be conscious of uh, the local residents at the, tra at the training facility and communicating with them as well and making sure that the message is clear um, and um, and especially there's 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 other um, planning applications around the training facility, so we're, we're conscious of those as well. So. Yes, uh, you uh, is it possible to obtain category one in the championship, or must you be in the Premiership to get that? No, no, you can uh, you can certainly achieve that in the in the championship. Um, yeah, um, is is the straightforward answer to that. And um, our, our intention, all, all academies have a three-year, it's a cycle of a three-year audit, and our next audit is due in 2016-17. And it's our ambition and intention to be audited for Category 1 in that season. Could, could, yeah. I, could I just add, it is a, in reference to the, um, the Category 1 and the, the audit that, that takes place around the, um, the quality of coaching, um, and how the, co the coaches have to record everything they do um, to one prove um, what they're doing, but two to see to, to see the development of the um, of the, the, the players um, and the um, and the kids that uh, join the football club and in particular Charlton. The um, it, it's 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 incredible um, that lev that level of audit. And myself and Steve had the opportunity to go to several clubs in in the championship, some who were successful. Um, in, in getting category one and some who weren't so we're, there's a, a lot of work going behind the scenes to kind of support the quality of the coaching um, to uh, our academy okay any more questions for the academy or do you want to move on now to our young lads here the skipper and the new signing Thinking back to the start of the season, the great start we made, and remember particularly Derby County, or I think far and away the best team in this division, and I thought we totally outplayed them. Everybody was getting very excited and talking about a realistic chance of the playoffs. Thinking back to the last few home games, I've dreaded coming to the Valley. The people are sitting talk to her in a pit of despair up until last Saturday, of course. I just wonder, from your point of view, what was the reason for that decline? What went wrong? Well, I don't actually n can't pinpoint an answer. If I knew that, we, you know, we would have put it right. I think it was a combination of a lot of things: loss of form from from players, 
Um, the fact that we suffered from suspensions, injuries, and, and our squad just wasn't big enough to deal with it. Um, I think, you know, we changed the team quite a lot. We could probably, after that first sort of 10 games where we had quite a settled t team, um, I think we, you know, we had to make a lot of changes and uh, that never helps to have that continu continuity. Um, and sometimes it's, you just you, you just don't know the answer. If I, if I, if I knew like, where to put it right on the training ground, we were trying terribly hard, but sometimes you just, you know, you, when you're losing games, you get in a bit of a rut and uh, certainly that's what happened. We found it difficult and consequently you know, our confidence took a dent and then it makes it even harder to get out of. So um, that is, that's the, the best answer I could give you, really. It's, it's hard to say any one thing, but um, I think it's a combination of all those things. <coughs> I've, I've got my feet on the ground and you mentioned the pitch. And I think as somebody who was here last year, the pitch, well, is it a green carpet, Johnny, compared with last year? And Tony, is this the best pitch you've ever played on? Because <laughs> well, Tony would probably just say it's a normal pitch, but he wasn't here last year. So, <laughs> uh, Obviously, I mean, last year, we're, it was well documented. It was spoke about all the time. It was, it was a terrible pitch. S towards the end, it was literally unplayable. You couldn't play any sort of football on it and you know you've seen the difference um it's a great pitch and you know the club should be you know the, the they've got accolades for it but that is the way that a football pitch should be for me you go to a lot of a lot of grounds in the championship um certainly majority of the grounds in the championship and that is how pitches are so um brilliant that the club you know uh, uh, have put that in place but for me that should be that should be the standard of pitch, especially for for a team like us where, you know, we can probably of late, we say we haven't played much football, but certainly at the start of the season we was playing some some lovely stuff and if you're gonna if you're gonna do that or you're gonna try and do that, you have to have a pitch to match it. And if you see Blackpool's on the telly, I think they they've borrowed ours from last year. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's no way that they you can play any football on it and and consequently, you know, the uh what what you guys are watching is going to obviously be affected by that. So is it the best pitch you've ever played on? <laughs> no, it's it's definitely a good pitch. You usually, when when you're playing out there and it's a bad pitch, you need to you need to worry more about your touches, everything. And and, and Saturday it, it was fine. There was no problems, and we showed that obviously the we with the way we played and. For us, it's easy to play on that because you, there's nothing more to worry about. It's it's perfect for me. It's it's one of the better ones I've played on for sure. Uh, on 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 the pitch, uh, Nathan, the groundsman at the Valley, keeps reminding me that on the current uh, score, because you get a a, a a score at the end of every game, and we're in the top four at the moment. So in the, in the whole of the championship, so he's doing a great job. Yeah, I've got a question for Johnny. Um, Johnny, you've been the most consistent player over the past few seasons. Unfortunately, I'm hearing a few rumours that you might be on your way soon. Um, so I wanted to make sure that's, that's rubbish. And second... Uh, where, where am I going? Okay. Well, unfortunately, I hear you're going to the he who must not be named up north, so... No, I right. do hope that's not true, because he certainly won't be getting applause from me <laughs> in terms of the valley. But anyway, Johnny, the second question is, I know that you're very much into your coaching. Um, and that's something you seems to be very close to your heart. You both in the school, locally. Um, is there any offers from the club for you to join the coaching team or? Catch me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just said that uh, I cannot change a manager anymore. So. And I'm not saying he doesn't have to be manager yet. But apparently, according to the press, he did the team talk for Saturday. <laughs> but I just like to know if he's going to be uh, offered a coaching role at some point. Well, uh, I'm in the very sort of infancy of my. Uh, qualifications so to speak from from my coaching it's something I, like you say I am very interested in and something that I want to pursue but um, I'm enrolled to take the uh, B license this summer which Steve will tell you is probably the, f the first step of, of many um, 
required to uh, to coach and, and manage at, at this level. So certainly it's something that I, you know that I've I thought a lot about and appeals to me. But um, and and uh, the process has, has begun, but it's very very early stage. I still still uh, want to play for as long as I can. To be honest, so you're a long time. <laughs> well, as long as they have me. Yeah. I'd like to ask a question um, and, and an observation, really. Uh, Saturday was a revelation. And I think the revelation was that uh, we defended because we attacked. All the way through the match, uh, we were up front and going for it. Whereas the previous weeks, we'd been falling back and defending and falling into the same trap. Were the players conscious of that? And are they going to do the same thing from here on out? <laughs> well, we're going to try. <laughs> um, I think we've been working really hard on the training ground since since the new manager has come in. Uh, a lot of credit's got to go to him because he has been working tirelessly um, on us because we required a lot of work. <laughs> And uh, we've been watching a lot of video analysis and doing a lot of work related to that on the training ground. And he's very sort of structured and sure of, of what he wants from each player and uh, from specific positions. He's, he's often on it, Mr. Watt here, to, to get the best out of him. And I think you saw that Saturday that, that he certainly did. Um, <laughs> so I think a lot of credit has got to go to the manager because I think it was the first performance where he will say that we implemented exactly what he's been tr been trying to get across. Um, he's he's only been in a short time, and it's very difficult to to get your your ways across straight away. Um, and I think Saturday was the first time that you really saw. Um, I had to, can't speak for him, but I'm sure he would say that that we played like it's like how he wants his teams to play, whereas previously we probably haven't. So. Hopefully, um, yeah, it's the start of many. Just a question for Tony Watt. Um, you may be aware there's a forum called Charlton Life. Uh, after Saturday, you were described on there as a Scottish sexual monster. <laughs> 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 Do you have any comment? Uh... I, f I think I'm a bit too young to know what that means, so I'll just, <laughs> I'll, I'll sidestep that one. Uh, <laughs> don't know if it's a compliment or not. It's <laughs> what do you think, Jacko? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I've got a question for Johnny, please. It's about tactics, so perhaps you can use his uh, coaching now to answer. For some time now, although we didn't on Saturday, for some time now we've employed the tactic of a, a right-footed player on the left of midfield and a right and a left-footed <laughs> player on the right. Now that may have advantages, but I think it also has massive disadvantages. And, and one of the players in particular looked pretty uncomfortable in that position. So how did, for example, Bob Peters explain to you that that was the right way to go about things? Well, he didn't uh, explain to me. That was just obviously became apparent that that was his preference. And I think if you speak to Johan Gudmundsen, who's one of those players, he will tell you that, that that's his favoured position. Playing off the right, cutting in, gives him the opportunity, like you see, he scored you know, a lot of goals from that position, coming in on, on his left foot and uh, getting shots away. Uh, you know, one of the other, the obviously on the other side, we haven't had someone who's probably natural to that position like Johan is, and yeah, that might have been you know, a problem from time to time, but um, certainly, I think Johan's, for me, been our best player so far this season, and he's been employed from that position. So, I haven't seen it as um, as a massive disadvantage to the. playing out there who looks <coughs> uncomfortable he, and because he's always got to cut back in and I mean when I played it was better to go down the line and wang a ball in basically <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I, 
I think the answer to that is uh, Bob wasn't one for bombarding the, the box with crosses because we don't have a lot of height we might score. in the middle. He, he preferred, well, um, you know, I, I can't answer for him, but he preferred to try and play intricate sort of stuff around the box into feet. He wasn't one for get down the side of them, get crosses in. Um, I think probably because of the lack of height and the lack of a you know a real target man in the box. If you, if you had Peter Crouch in your team, and you and you was trying to play intricate stuff around the box, then it would be foolish. But we didn't have that sort of player, so that's probably part of the reason. And um, I think you know some games, some games, a lot of games just worked. Jordan scored a few, few goals coming in off that side as well. So no, I, um, I don't doubt that. But again, on Saturday we played a left-footed player on the left of our midfield and. He had quite a good result, didn't he? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's the way forward then. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's, it's, you know, it's been crying out for ages. It that's, seems to be the wrong tactic, that's all. I've seen. Any more questions for the lads? <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't, be, I won't be fit for Friday. I don't know, to be honest. Uh, I've had a scan and... I need to have a like real chat with the the physio tomorrow about a plan going forward, but I'll, I would imagine that I will miss, you know, a number of games. Hopefully, well, I, I don't want to put a number on it because it, it, it's difficult to know until you start the rehab, really. But um, certainly, I'll miss you know three or four games. I would think. <laughs> That's how I feel. Who is responsible for um, selecting the, the colours of the kit the team playing? <laughs> Only um, <coughs> my father first brought me to the valley in 1948. Never since that time, I can't ever remember them not playing with white shorts, you know. And uh, I noticed um, at the Cardiff game, Vincent Tan was looking at the way support of Cardiff, the Bluebirds, and there wasn't one red shirt in there. And he has now rescinded, and uh, they're going to play in blue. Uh, Chris, Chrissy Parks, would you like to take that question? <laughs> well, I have to say I'm inclined to agree with that, uh, Dave, unfortunately. It, but it's not my choice of, of kit. But um, uh, I just put the... That was what I was told to put in the handbook, and that's what I, I did. But uh, you're right that the Bluebirds have gone back to wearing blue. And for a personal, on a personal basis, I'd like to see us wearing white shorts. But... Uh, I think the kit looks good, looks fine, and I, I, I'm, I'm one of those that lo quite likes the orange kit as well. So, um, <laughs> so what do I know about colours? Um, so, yeah. I don't know. I, I guess we, we'll make that decision again in the summer, and, and uh, there'll be a choice of kits, and, uh, and we'll, we'll go with whatever we, we think is going to be the best seller in the in the shop. I don't know how it's been. Uh, we, we may have sold lots and lots of red shorts. I don't know. So it may have worked. But Chrissy, we've lost. Both games when we wore an orange, haven't we? Shows what I know about f kits, yeah. <laughs> I just saw Barcelona wear it a couple of times. I think that's what it was. <laughs> OK, any, any more questions from the floor, then? For Tony Watt, we've seen bits of you, Tony. But we've only seen you for 90 minutes twice. So you, you're going to be ready for the full game from now on, or are you still getting back to match fitness? Uh. Obviously, I hope to play the, the 90, but in the last year or something, I think I've only played maybe two or three competitive 90s, so for me, it's it was going to take time, but uh, when I came here, I was I thought I was ready. I had hard training, I got got a good uh, programme behind me, and I, f I feel like I'm ready for the 90, but that's not my decision now. It's, it's not in my hands. So you worked well on Saturday, well played. Question for Katrine, is that all right now? Yep. Yeah. Just earlier on there was the question about is the owner aware of the extent of the dismay and disillusion which is going to turn into season tickets and was he, was he worried about it? Did he care? And, and you only answered the latter bit. You said, of course he cares. Is he, do you think he is aware of the number of people who this season and certainly in the last couple of months have made the decision to stop coming? to not renew their season tickets. 
um, because I think it's, it's enormous. And I only say that from people I speak to and message boards, but people are saying, I've watched dreadful football at Charlton for years, and that's fine, didn't like it, but I knew we were all pulling in the same direction. Now it feels different. It feels like we're part of a rich man's uh, vanity experiment. I don't feel it appeals to me emotionally anymore. I'm not going to come. And that's what people are saying. And does he realize that? I think this is also probably a question about my role in the club because I think, or I was screamed in the face with people say that I'm a puppet and whatever, which is very nice, obviously. Um, I, he's aware and, and we have daily conversations on the phone and, and I try to make him aware, but part of my role here at the club is as well um, to, 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 to handle th this and, and it's my job to, to, to make this work with you, with you guys. And I, I feed him obviously with the relevant information uh, and I, I obviously consult with him because he has a, a lot of experience, uh, in unfortunately also in these kind of situations. Uh, but it's up to me to to make this work. Um. I think. Well, well I mean. Well, the only thing that I can say, and I will say it again, uh, we try, the only way we can entice you again to, to come to the Valley is to provide good football on the pitch, uh, which is a responsibility that I share with, um, with, the, with the staff of Phil Chapel. And then I, I will try to, we will try to invest in the facilities and I will try to engage with the fans as much as possible. Oh, sorry, it's not the facilities. Okay, okay. So you, you say that Tony Watt sitting here is not a decent player? Of course Tony Watt's a decent player. It's not Tony Watt and Johnny Jackson that the problems, they're great players. So it's, it's Polish Pete. It's like Nigo. Yeah. It's can, all that can have a, that we've been sent. Can I have a quick can I say a few words? <laughs> um, just on this. First of all, I think there were, mis there were mistakes made last January. And people accept it. The people in charge accept it. The players sent over weren't good enough for us. And that's why they decided they've got to upgrade. And I think a lot of fans don't understand that having people like Tony and Igor Vent uh, and Johan, these are all players who, under the last regime, we could not have afforded. And therefore, as fans, we're going to get the pleasure out of playing those. As far as the managers are concerned, I understand why everybody was upset, because they hadn't heard of Guy Luzon. I w we knew he was OK. Had, 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 well, Guy Luzon's wife joined Charlton Twitter and signed up two weeks before he was a coach. Well, I don't know about that, but we all we all knew. I can't. I can't be most known, but I know of three people who were interviewed. Yes, they were all Roland's contacts, but I know of three people who was interviewed. I was talked to on the phone twice by Roland, and I gave my input. No. No. It's not fair to the two who are turned down. And, 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 and the three that were interviewed, were they from outside of the club? By out, uh, as, as in, was it Damien, Matthew? And oh, outside of the club, yes. That's, that's all I'm going to say on and that. They were all interviewed on the but Monday. English experience. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, it's it's exactly what she said, the English experience. Can we move on? They could speak English? There were three names. Can, can anyway, you, what, what do you mean English experience? They could speak English, or what do you mean? Now, come on, does every club have this, that you want to know every person we interviewed? That's not normal. There were three managers interviewed. Yes. Yes. Next question. Yes, sir. Um, a question for Catrian. There clearly is a problem, because I know lots of people who have been coming for decades, and that, that's what they're saying. They're not going to renew their season tickets, which I'm concerned about, and I think the club 
should be concerned about. Do you not think that it might partly address the problem if Roland attended more of our games and adopted a higher profile so people could see him about? Um, I, I honestly... Uh, it's it's uh, frustrating for me, basically, because he sees all the games of us. We have a live stream for him, so he basically sees all the games, and we are in daily contact. And you have to understand, we are high on his agenda. And I make sure, that's why I go to Bel I went to Belgium yesterday, I make sure we are a priority, we are a priority for investing in the club. Uh, and he cannot just be everywhere. He's an, a, a very... Um, Bus very busy businessman. It's it's a cliche, but it's true. And I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that all the owners of the other championship clubs are out there on every game match day as well. Um, and uh, also, um, during the weekend, he tries to be with his family, and I cannot uh, call his wife and say, "Hey, no, he needs to come to Charlton to watch a game while he can s uh, he can see it at home with his family." And I, I really. Um, I mean, I spoke with him uh, as well about his visibility and, and um, he wants uh, me and the rest of my staff to be basically the face of the club. Why? Because we basically are running the club. And I think m many people might not believe in it, but uh, it, it's us doing this. He cannot do him this self. Uh, everybody thinks there is this invisible hand from Belgium determining everything in this club. Uh, he doesn't have the time to do that. It's us here at the table who decide the daily running of this football club. And so, if if everybody, if if we have, if I want, you need to hold me responsible. And I'm, and that's why I'm meeting you here now, and I'm trying to give you explanations for everything that happened because ultimately I'm the responsible for this club. I, I'm not expecting him to attend every single game. I don't know how many games he's been to, but I get the impression it's very few. But I'd just like you to know that the people I'm talking to, and they're very committed Charlton fans, are saying that he's just not interested in the club. No, but I say, but I say differently, and I, either you believe me or you don't. If yeah. you think uh, somebody commits to investing in a training ground, building a new training ground, if you uh, don't believe if investing in the summer over a million pounds, if, if you don't believe that we're high on his agenda, I mean, there's not much more than I can do than, than to say those kind of things no, to no, you. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just passing on to you. That's the view. Whenever he comes over, people. whenever he comes over, it's during the week. So if there is a possibility that there is a Tuesday game at the Valley, I try to arrange uh, him visiting. I think uh, the one he attended was the Bolton game. Uh, was a, a while ago now. And uh, last time he came over, there was no game uh, during the week here at the Valley. So I always try to arrange a schedule, but I getting him over here already for a couple of days is, is already quite difficult. Um, so, and if it's with a game, I try, but uh, it's not always possible. Could you explain why we aren't actually going to carry on with the VIP scheme? Um, I would um, maybe speak for a number of folk here, but I, I, I don't know. Um, I joined it and when Richard Murray and the Pope um, set the scheme up back, well, it must be 25 years, it feels like that anyway. Um, it seems an odd thing to do um, in the sense that, firstly, we're all here, and then secondly, you're telling us that there isn't going to be a scheme um, from a business perspective, I would have thought money in the bank wasn't uh, a bad idea. I think, um, as I understand it, uh, the scheme was called uh, or was put into place uh, many years ago because there was a cash flow problem. Uh, so, and you all were so good to basically help the club out with that, which I think everybody at this table is very grateful for. Um, and I acknowledge all of your contribution to this. Um, uh, luckily, we don't have this problem <laughs> anymore. And um, I think um, given that, well, some of the, the reasons behind this is, first of all, the boardroom is going to be much smaller next year. So, for instance, one of the perks of being in the boardroom will not be available. But second of all, I think um, it, it's up to us now to, to convince you, basically, every year to renew your season ticket and you will keep us up our toes. and. Uh, I just had a fan also asking me uh, whether we will hold this kind of meeting still, and I'm still open to do a Q&A uh, for you guys, for all kinds of fans. I don't want, it's not that I don't want to do these events anymore, but I want it to be open to, to everybody, uh, and also, obviously, you guys. And, I mean, uh, I don't know whether it was communicated, but part of the, uh, the um, for thanking you for, for, for supporting the club uh, so much, 
and the last years was a, is that you will have a discount on your on your next season ticket. Um, I'm conscious that most of the questions now seem to be aimed at Katrine and Richard. What about our two lads? Because um, I'd I like them to, you know, they need their beauty sleep. So if we could, <laughs> if we could finish off with the lads first, we can actually let them go. Any questions for the lads? No, it's not. Um, it, it it can make it quite difficult when you're out on the pitch and, and, and the atmosphere is like that. Um, obviously, I've been here a long time and you know, I know quite a bit about the club and what's going on and I can relate to the fans' frustrations at times. Um, but, you know, a lot of the boys out there wouldn't, you know, wouldn't see that because see that they haven't been here for that long time. All they, all they see is that the crowd are... Are booing, are booing them and booing their team and um, certainly I mean it doesn't have a po positive effect some people can probably just block it out some people can't but those people that can't it's obviously going to affect you know is it, th there's there's no way it can be a positive thing that's for sure so I think it's just a way of, of, of venting frustration you know not everyone can can be in a room here and and add their voice heard it's their only way of uh, of being heard, basically. So, you know, I, I get that. I'm, I'm a football fan myself, so I understand that. But I obviously, I can see the other side of it. I'm on the pitch when it's happening. And to answer your question, no, it's, it's, never, it's never helpful. Mate, yeah, this is for Tony Watt. Um, I don't know if you know about the long history of Cheltenham Athletic, but to uh, just give you a short history, a year <laughs> ago, a young player come into our team uh, in about this time of year, and at the end of the season, he was made player of the year. The way you played on Saturday, if you keep doing that again, you may well be player of the year this year. <laughs> Do you want him to answer that, Mick? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no I, for me, it's just every, every game at a time. Uh, for me, I'm happiest when I'm playing football and... If I'm playing regularly, then it shows on and off the field. Like for me, if I'm if I'm not playing, it gets you down after after the games. And if you're not playing well, it, it affects you in your your life outside the uh, off of the field as well. So for me, I'm just hoping to play every week and and show what I can do if I if I've if I've got enough to show and and hopefully I can be a success here. Yeah, Jean, sorry. Um, I think we're all conscious of the rumours that were going around before Bob left the, the, um, the club of um, a not very happy dressing room. Um, not wanting to cast any aspersions on anyone, but I'd just like to know what, on a scale of 1 to 10, the feeling is compared with let's say six weeks ago. Are you a happier bunch of players now than you were? So I think that, that affects, you know, we like to feel you're Okay. Well, it's, it's 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 all it's all result dependent, Jane. If you if we'd have had this meeting and this time last week, <laughs> I'd, have, I'd have said oh, we're in probably a worse place. But you know, you get a win and you see the performance and you see the reaction of the crowd, and all of a sudden, you know, it feels like you turn a corner. So it, a lot of, a lot of the frustration and you know the dressing room was down because we was losing. And that was the main that was the main reason for, you know, probably morale being low because footballers hate to lose, um, and it it was getting us all down. When you come into work on a Monday morning after you've been defeated on a Saturday, it, it, it's, it's it's a gloomy place, you know. When you come in on a Monday and you've won, everyone's bouncing and high fiving and Tony's singing and <laughs> you know it's just a, it's just a better place to be. It's a better workplace, work, work environment. That all all comes from winning. So well, exactly, yeah. It sort of it, it, it spreads. You know, you could you could feel that the atmosphere was. You know, we sent everyone home with a smile on their face, including ourselves. So it was a good day. It was it was a good day for the club. Okay, I'm going to let uh, Tony and Johnny vamoose if they would too. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to uh, questions. Um, Mr. Hayes. Well, I think we do appreciate the investment that's coming on the academy and on the pitch and that, that we've now got better owners than we had before. There's still a lot of concerns being raised about uh, Roland's influence on the team. We've had comments from Alex Dyer. Um, from Bob Peters and from, is it Redditch, the uh, Stanley Age coach, that he doesn't want a coach, he wants a, a puppet. Can you tell us more about these allegations that he's interfering in the selection of the team and telling the coaches which players to play? Uh, well, all the people that you named are ex-employees, to put it already, to start with, in perspective. Um, and like I said before, um, there are no puppets in this club, not at all. And... Um, we always try to work together and uh, the manager or head coach is solely responsible for the team selection. I mean, that would be completely uh, mind-blowing if not. And um, the only thing that there is an influence from Belgium is when there is a lot of money involved in transfers. And that's it. And I think that's normal and that's in every other club. I don't. I don't think uh, Katrine needs to uh, answer that question. Uh, no, no, can no, no. I can. I no, can. I, I, I mean, I just say that when Alex Dyer um, put this interview, he was still on the contract with us, but he was aware that he was not taking on uh, getting a new role at the club. I'm, I, I am not here to 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 bash on other people. It's not my style, and it will never be my style. Uh, uh, Bob Peters uh, chose to do an interview in South London Press. They called me for a reaction, but I just said, I don't feel like a reaction. It's not my style to, to, to comment on other people's comments. I will. They have their own version. Yeah. I mean, um, rather, yeah, sorry. Preston's. Uh, Katrine, um, you introduced a £150 season ticket last year um, in the East Stand. Right? I'm a VIP member, I sit in the middle of the East Stand and I have people from that section sitting in front of me a lot of weeks and I look at the covered end and it's half empty. Is this policy going to be revised? Are you going to have cheap tickets in the covered end rather than in the East Stand where they're free to move about and sit wherever they like? We're looking at uh, the offer of £150 uh, pounds and uh, we'll soon communicate about that. Um, uh, I understand that obviously sitting in the East End and having uh, the lower value tickets close to you is not ideal. Um, so we are well aware of this problem and we uh, will we'll soon make a decision. Yeah, because I, I appreciate the, you know, the offer of the discount you've just made, but... You know, should I pay another five hundred pound next year, or should I pay one hundred and fifty and then just walk over and sit in the same seat I'm in now? <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. <coughs> yes, sir. Um, before the game last Tuesday against Norwich City, ten minutes before kickoff, there was not a single program seller outside the club selling programs. Um, it was extremely difficult to get one. A number of people I know didn't get any at all. So. Um, where have all the program sellers gone? Yeah, it's a, it's an issue. We have a, a bit of a roller coaster for the moment with the program sellers. Um, I had improved already a lot on, on Saturday. Um, it's something I try to um, make better, and um, we had some problems, uh, but we're addressing it. And I think the first step was Saturday. But we're aware that the service has not been great. Uh, but uh, today, actually, I was choosing the new stands uh, to sell programs for. And um, I sat down with uh, our new head of ticketing, and uh, she, I already congratulated her because for me also the previous program sellers, they were not proactive enough, and for the first time um, this Saturday they tried to sell me a program. <laughs> so, <laughs> so hopefully it's a, a, it's a step in the right direction, but I acknowledge that we made some errors uh, previously. No, there, was a, there was a contract with the previous sellers which we, which we ended, 
uh, and we now took everything in house uh, basically f for and that's that's where this decision came from uh, my question relates to the zoning of the tickets sorry to the zoning of the tickets because I sit where the crossbars tickets were going to be what's happening with that because that's something I'm not interested in at all and the crossbars no yeah the 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 formula of crossbars will be uh, very different uh, I mean we obviously I uh, realized that it was not a success story, and um, we have come up with something new, but you will have to wait for the Huddersfield game. <laughs> Thanks, I've uh, got two questions. First of all, you're saying about all the um, investments sort of off the field, um, one of them being the pitch and the other being the training ground and youth facilities. Firstly, wasn't the training and youth, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't that partly funded by the Premier League and the um, University of Greenwich or the other sort of potential? You're uh, talking about an investment of over £10 million. Pounds. Yeah. I don't think uh, that um, neither of the parties you just suggested can um, put okay. that on the table. Okay, fair enough. But you've also mentioned the pitch. Uh, that was well aware before the uh, club was purchased. Was that not? included in the purchase price of the club? Was that not seen as a liability before it was purchased? No, obviously not. I mean, it's it, it's something, I mean, when we, when we bought the club, obviously you, see you don't have the best pitch, but it's only when you start, uh, I mean, when we did the scan under the, I mean, we, our, our due diligence didn't go that far that we, that we saw the DVD of the scan of the pipes under the pitch. No, okay. I can, and I just can say that. And one other thing, obviously, you said you wanted the com uh, sorry the club to be more business-like, um, considering that sort of by your own admission, the last managerial appointment didn't work. Do you think it was really worthwhile appointing the next manager within 24 hours? Don't you think a recruitment, sort of a better process should be put in place? Well, I think we did a good process. Uh, uh, obviously, um, well, you might disagree with that. And um, uh, especially in football, like I said, business is... <laughs> It's so uh, business and you need to make decisions very fast. Uh, what the business requires is an uh, appointment of a manager quite quite soon. Uh, and like I said before, Norwich and Nottingham Forest did it much faster than we did. Yeah, this message is for Katrine, or oh, question, sorry. Katrine, obviously we're well aware that West Ham will be moving into the Olympic Stadium the season after next. And they, from what I understand, they'll be giving away 10,000 tickets every game. Now, there's been talk around the Valley Express. Um, I know it's not money-making, but I, I don't know what's going to happen with that. But given tonight a number of people are saying they're not going to renew their season tickets, um, what contingency plans have we got in place? I mean, if you see in the standard every week, they can't sell out now, West Ham are advertising. What they're obviously doing is they're cut prices incredibly low for young children to entice them, because that's the next bank of supporters that we lost when we were at Sellers Park, unfortunately, we lost a generation. I just wondered, you know, what are the club planning to do about West Ham? I know when I went to the VIP meetings, excuse me, <coughs> about the um, possibility of renewing the VIP, Ben Kensel was very dismiss dismissive of what would happen and seemed to think he had a gentleman's agreement with West Ham that they wouldn't flood our area. But I find that very, very <laughs> unlikely because West Ham are going to be looking to grab people to come. And to be honest, Charlton Athletic against Norwich or even Brentford or West Ham against Manchester United. I mean, personally, I wouldn't cross the road to see them, but there's going to be a number of people and floating supporters that are going to. And if the aim is to get to the Premiership in the next few years, obviously we need to have the support behind us to fund this. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, obviously I cannot communicate yet on the, on the prices for next season, but... One of the main things in there is 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 basically uh, to make football affordable for children uh, because we understand that it is the future. Um, second to that, I obviously am being a, a lawyer in that area with the illegal state aid background. Uh, I'm not too happy with the West Ham situation, but um, it is a fact. So we now have to deal with it. Uh, but I'm I'm confident that Charlton can offer something mu very different from West Ham. I feel some, I mean, I've been to West Ham before, even before I was involved in Charlton and didn't have the same warm feeling about the club than I had with Charlton when I first attended the game. 
And I think, I mean, a lot of people criticize us and, and say that Charlton is losing his identity. And, and I, will, I think our identity and our strong core values about a family club where it's nice to come and where prices, ticket prices are affordable is something that we should make sure that it's still a priority and it, it will be a priority. And people coming into the grounds will have a different experience from people going to the stadium of West Ham. And we, m we have to really make sure we, we keep this in mind in everything that we do with the, with the club. Rabbi. Yeah, um, I was a bit confused when our new manager was good enough for us, but uh, it, when he was at Standard, that they were going to riot to get rid of him. Uh, how, how comes he got improved in six months? No, I, I think um, the um, well, there are very different circumstances, obviously, in, in Standard Liège. Um, but um, as Guy said it in his press conference before, uh, he was not getting the results. Um, which happens at, at a, with a manager, at, uh, every manager at some point in his career. Um, but um, the owner still believed in his ability to, to get good results and, and that he is a good coach. And um, that's why he's here now. But uh, what happened in Standard Liège are very diffi difficult and different circumstances. Um, yeah, can, can we just bring some some other people into the conversation now. Any questions for David at the end there? He can talk you through financial fair play or get Richard involved. Katrine's um, doing all the work at the moment. Yes, I'm getting paid a lot, so I have to. <laughs> so I've been told. Well, good evening. Um, you want to talk about finance? I've got a question on finance. How much money did we uh, spend on players coming outside of <coughs> Roland's network? And how much money did we get back in from players that we sold outside of the network? You asked for a finance question. You got it for me. That's a good test. Um, if you want to go downstairs, get your laptop out. <laughs> get me a spreadsheet. Yeah, I can't, I can't answer that specifically now. I don't have the split. Um, we did invest in... Um, well over four million pounds um, in in the year to June 14, which is which which is the latest set of available financial statements, and they're publicly available now. I don't know if anyone's got those yet, but they've just been filed at Company's House. So um, that gives you an idea of, of the investment going on in players. I don't have the split. I'm sure the split is that we invested more than we got in return. I can tell you that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's true. I mean, I, uh, I, I think David. Ab absolutely. I mean, in terms of um, uh, profit on player trading, in terms of cash coming in, we're looking at 1.7 million last year. <coughs> yeah. 1.7 versus 4.10. Yeah. So it gets you up to 3.3. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, can David ever see us uh, breaking even in the championship? I know Kathleen said earlier that we're sort of working towards it. Uh, but so far, all we seem to have heard of is expenditure on the stadium of a million pounds, doing the training ground up, uh, more coaches for the <coughs> jet category one. And the only contribution seems to be bringing the club shop back in-house, which we presumably took out of house because we weren't making any money out of it on it in the first place. It's, um, it's a good question, and it's a real challenge at this level. Every, every club at the championship is, uh, is, is really struggling. Um, you know, if you look at all the championship clubs, I would say for certainty Blackpool will, will break even this year, but, but look at the position they're in. Um, we, are, we are moving towards a break-even position. Uh, when, I, when I first joined... My f well... I'll put some numbers around it. We, you know, when I first joined, we were we were at seven million, and then we got down to six, and uh, and you know, five point seven for for last year. This year, we're looking around about the five million mark. Um, in the next two years, there's going to be quite a significant additional stream of central income from the both the football league and the Premier League. So next year, we'll we'll see the new football league deal kick in, and that'll be uh, well at least half a million pounds per annum extra. But obviously the big one is, uh, and, and you'll all have seen it, is the, um, the new Premier League 
um, TV rights deal. Obviously, only the UK rights have been announced, but that's a 70% increase. And the way the new solidarity payments work um, for, the, for the next three-year deal is the is solidarity is intrinsically linked to the deal that the Premier League has, has negotiated. So we'll see um, an increase, assuming we're still, um, you know, we haven't reached the Premier League at this point in time. Uh, we'll see an increased solidarity of roughly £2 million. If you add into that the additional revenue that we'd love to generate from EPPP Category 1 status, that's um, 350. So you're looking at at least £3 million there in the next two years of, of additional revenue. And I'm not even looking at any, that's not taking into account any increase in sponsorship deals, um, you know, increased revenue generated from hospitality. It's, uh, so that gives you an idea of where, where we can move towards to. But it, it's, it, well, it, it's not bottom line break even, no. <laughs> and I think actually it's just worth Richard? No, no, can I just say, it's very interesting, those figures, because, yeah, we know we have a communication problem and that's something we've got to improve. But as far as the owner's concerned, you know, he bought the club for a lot of money, as I think people know. I don't, I am not going to quote the figure, but most people on message boards have got it pretty accurate. Um, he's been running the club at about a five million a year loss on player wages. We've talked about the academy and the pitch, and he's made a net uh, contribution towards transfers of 2.3 million this year. So there may be a few problems, but it's not easy to find somebody to say, do you want to buy a championship club? That's what it's going to cost you. You're going to run five million a year losses. So all Roland wants to do, and I don't think this is a bad thing as a businessman, his aim is, he's got two aims. He wants to go up. And he'd love the club to run at a break-even so he didn't have to put his hand in his pocket except for transfers, which would be, you know, to accumulate to go up. Just, um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought now. Um, yeah, just picking up Catherine's point about a warm club, and I think that's true, Charlton supporters don't want to be antagonistic to the club, and maybe we were spoilt for all Richard's years when we all felt part of it. But however much extra money we get in from the Premier League or other sources, there are still a lot of people who are walking away feeling alienated. And Katrine has done a lot, and this evening presumably is part of that process to try and win that argument. I know Richard's done a lot. But Mr. de Chatelet is not winning the PR argument that he really cares about this club and he really wants to listen to people. So I suppose my question, Richard, is what is there any opportunity of actually getting him to engage in a real dialogue with supporters who understand the issues around the club? He doesn't have to talk to the supporters' trust. He could go to an away game and come home on the train. <laughs> but, but we would suggest, we would suggest a more structured that, that comes down to the argument, do you have faith in me? Because I tell you just now that I'm here to, to help you with that. But people are walking away, Katrine, and so... Yeah, but I, that I take the train with the fans, I, and I meet the real fans. I know the concerns, and we try to address them. And it seems a bit... And, and it's not that we want to hide Mr. Duchatelet from you guys, but he, tr he put me in this position because he trusts me and because he, he knows we can do this job for him. And that's, that's ultimately but I where it whether comes he's down. I ultimately, he's actually the only person who can really convince people. Because people have got this idea that you're a puppet, right? I mean, I'm just, it, that's the way it is. And, and how can he convince them then? Then doing the same thing like, like here? Yes, probably. That, that would be true. People do want to hear from him. They see him as a distant... But I say, everything, I say everything that I know he wants, and okay. I know he translates. And either you, 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 you believe me or you don't. Okay. But my question was... You know, what could we do, what could you do, maybe, to get him to come and enter in that dialogue? And if, if it can't The be entering done, it can't of the dialogue done. is via me. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, the end of the evening. Thank you. <laughs>